And with that, hello and welcome to episode five of the Scholastic Sit Down. This is Dylan Ward. My name is Luke Jordan. We are happy to be with you and talk Illinois high school hockey as always. Dylan, how are we feeling today? Pretty good. Feeling good. Uh, episode number five. Really can't believe it. This podcast is uh, really starting to become a seasoned vet after uh, a couple of rookie episodes, but uh, I think we're getting a good flow going and uh, I'm excited to talk about some more SHL, some huge games last week too. Absolutely. And before we hop right into those, we're just going to give you a little bit of the length of how this is going to work today. We're going to go of course, into the last week recap, we have a lot to unfold, nine games, and we have 10 games in the future to cover this week, so that'll take up a majority of our time. But in between, we'll get to talk to St. Ignatius head coach and owner of the bar and hockey bar, Spencer Montgomery. We'll also get to talk about the outside of the SHL, then preview the week, of course. Question of the week is a very lengthy and interesting one, and then trivia one that you better not cheat on, all right? So looking into last week, we started with our hockey on Monday, and it was Loyola and York, and shockingly a very low-scoring affair. Loyola gold winning this one one to nothing over the Dukes. Charlie trapped the sophomore 28 save shutout, the lone goal coming from Jack Blazjowski on the power play. Yeah, and uh, keep in mind that this is the day after uh, – um... York beat New Trier. So then they go back home and play Loyola and they kept it close again. I would say that as of right now, um, based on SHL play, New Trier and Loyola are kind of that one, two punch in the state of Illinois. And uh, so two tough ones for York. And like I said, they keep it close, but they do come away without a point, the one nothing win. And I want to speak about Charlie trap for a second. He had an absolutely outstanding freshman year in the SHL. I believe it was seven shutouts for him, the future of Loyola gold hockey, and he has kept it up this season so far. So uh, Loyola is looking good. That made them three and zero at the time. And uh, yeah, they're, they're looking like a pretty good team to beat here in Illinois. Fast forward two days. Fenwick goes on the road to alumni Memorial field house to take on the Lake forest scouts. Although Fenwick out shooting Lake forest by one, a very bizarre total, by the way, 15 to 14. Not too often you see two incredibly low shot totals in the Scholastic Hockey League. The most shots by a team in a period was Fenwick in the third with seven. And you're looking at most SHL games where teams typically eclipse the double digits almost every period. But Lake Forest still comes away with this one. Logan Marsh stops fit 14 out of 15, and the scouts win by three, four to one. Yeah, he wasn't tested much, Luke, but it was enough as Lake Forest Scouts were able to score four goals on that amount of shots. And by the way, Sam Schwartz, who we had on last week, I know that he's always monitoring the game sheets. And uh, he actually gave Steve Sarauer, the head coach of Lake Forest, a call to make sure that those shot totals were accurate. And he confirmed that they were. So, yes, a very low uh, shot on goal game, but, uh, you know, not... Not low scoring in terms of the goals. Well, four to one, you can make the argument, but still Lake Forest able to capitalize on their opportunities. Yeah. And, you know, it had me thinking the same thing when I saw the shots on goal at first. I was almost wondering if I should even speak of them just because of how bizarre and rare it is to see something like that. But big thanks to Sam who gets us that confirmation. We go to Thursday night where Loyola is on the road at Stevenson. And Loyola Gold takes care of business again. Four to one victory. Declan Smith in net this time. They've been flip-flopping between Smith and Trap. And it was a one-one game up until the third period where the Ramblers found three goals and win this one four to one. Yeah, and uh, you know, this is after Stevenson had the one oh and oh start with that four to two win over the York Dukes back in September. And uh this made it three losses in a row after that. So uh and they they picked it back up later in the week, and we'll get to that. But Loyola, uh, you know, it, it's much more of a Loyola win than a Stevenson loss, I would say. They, you know, g- they're a great road team. They they know how to play in any given environment. And Twin Rinks is kind of a unique rink. Uh, I know some of the, the glass is n- uh, not see-through in some of the corners, which sometimes throws some players off. I know you could probably speak more about that, Luke, having been a player, yep. but... 
Loyola uh, beats York on Monday and then beats Stevenson. And so at this point in the record, they are now 4-0-0. So not too bad of a start for the Ramblers there. Another game on Thursday, Carmel hosting a red-hot new trier. Of course, for Carmel, this is their first SHL game, and they didn't get the warmest of welcomes from the Trevians, as the Trevians win this one 9-2, to scoring four goals in the first, one goal in the second, four goals in the third. Zachary Hebsch had a five-point performance, Dylan. How do you unfold that debacle? Well, five-point performance, but... What I really want to highlight here is the depth of Nutria Green. You look at that 9-2 to game, you got to figure maybe there's a hat trick in there. Maybe a couple of guys get multi-goal games. No, those goals came from five, uh, nine unique skaters for Nutria Green, just to list them off. Connor Herstritt had one. He had a pretty busy weekend as well later on. We'll get to that. Nolan Nagets, Dylan Hyman, Zach Hipsch, Jack Herstritt. Michael Pedreja, Ethan Baker, Max DeGroote, and Gunther Hutchin. Not in that order. That's just in their numerical jersey order. But, I mean, come on. That, that is incredible for head coach Adam Cheris. That's exactly what you want out of a hockey team. And, you know, they go in and play Carmel, who's had a, a tough, you know, couple of seasons in the SHL. Uh, but it was their first game, and they were probably fired up to be at home. But New Trier... Uh, Came to the came to the test and nine unique scores is just incredible. Yeah, and you know that's one of the things that Coach Cheris was saying was, you know, in episode two he mentioned how it was one of the things that really stuck out this year. He talked about how deep this team runs, and he's saying you can run three four lines in the third period consistently just because of how much talent there is from line one to line four, and you know that is literally what he says. That's his words being put right onto a game. I mean, he he nailed it. He knows exactly what his team has in strength, and you just listed it right there, Dylan. 9-2 to victory for the Trevians, as that would be the last game before we'd head into the weekend where we'd have two Saturday games and three Sunday games. So to look at Saturday, we go to Mount Prospect Ice Arena to begin things where the St. Viator Lions blank the Lake Forest Scouts by a score of 5 to nothing, outshooting the Scouts 37-13. to the scouts had some chances on the power play, but they end up going 0 for 4 on the night. Yeah, and uh, you get a combined 13 save shutout here for Lake Forest. Uh, Brock Herrer began the game, and then uh, I, I think you meant Vider. Yes, yes. Yeah, <laughs> all good. Uh, yeah. Yes, Brock Herrer. Brock Herrer started the game for head coach Tim Benz over there in Mount Prospect, and he got subbed off at the 8:59 mark of the second period. So Tim Ben's going with a as pretty much an even split as you can get subs in John Mayer. And uh, he comes in there and finishes the job. So, you know, I, I think that that's a, it's a unique decision by the coach. And, and I think a, a pretty good one, you know, you get your, your, you know, you could say number one goaltender and Brock hair starting the game, just make sure it doesn't get out of hand. And then at the point of the substitution, it was 2 nothing St. Vider, and they were controlling in shots as well, especially after out shooting the scouts 7-1 to one in the first period, then 18-4 to four in the second period. So they make the switch, and you get a combined shutout here in the SHL, which is something you don't see a lot in hockey. Then we went over to another game that had five goals, but this time a lot more evenly split. It took overtime for St. Ignatius to down the Glenbrook South Titans in their home opener. It was Austin Haynes on an assist from Jackson Steinloff. Brody Netsky plays a crucial role in between the pipes, too, for the Wolfpack, stopping 30 out of 32. Yeah, Glenbrook South uh, last season, they were known to put a lot of shots on goal up every single game. This one's no different, but if you run into a hot goaltender, it's not going to do the trick. And keep in mind, this is the first meeting of the season, or I should say first meeting since St. Ignatius knocked GBS out of both the SHL playoffs and the state playoffs, both in that quarterfinal spot. Uh, And in both instances, it was an upset according to the seeds. So. Glenbrook South, I'm sure, in their home opener, wanted to get some revenge over St. Ignatius, but they said not so fast. Every goal in regulation came in the second period, and it wasn't until that overtime, as you mentioned, Austin Haynes 
uh, gets his second goal of the game. And St. Ignatius stays red hot to start the season. That improved their record to 5-1-2. and two. Yeah, really excited to talk to Coach Montgomery eventually in this episode and figure out what's been going so well because this is obviously, you know, they were already pretty good last year, but they are more improved and it'll be exciting to talk to Coach when we get there. But for now, three games on Sunday. We'll highlight the big one to close things out, although it started the earliest in the day at 410 at America American Heartland. I'm guessing you guys are knowing which one we're talking about. But for now, we look at Glenbrook North taking down the Friars of Fenwick 4-1. to one. Glenbrook North, huge on the power play. They go 2-4. for four. And how about this? Daniel Rubin, younger sibling of Andrew Rubin, Absolutely. who works with select SHL Network broadcast, records a hat trick, and he had both power play goals. Yeah, and uh, we did not see a hat trick in the SHL this season until Sunday, and there were actually two of them. Yep. So Daniel Rubin, the, the Rubin family has been in that Glenbrook North organization for several years now. I think there was one before Andrew as well. But uh, GBN, listen, they played that two periods against Nutria Green in the game that ultimately got suspended. But besides that, this was their first three period SHL game since September 14th. So, Luke, that's literally a month. A month from in today. Game. <laughs> wow so yeah and that's the thing with the shl we always see the uh you know big gaps in games played especially early on in the season but i mean that is that's just insane and especially you know evan polakitis the head coach that, that guy's the president of the league I'm, I'm not sure how he let this scheduling happen but um gbn gets the win they are now one and one so they have the one nothing loss very early in the season to saint ignatius and then they get the win against Fenwick both of those games were on the road uh and uh you know much needed win for GBN I know we talked in episode one about how they're one of the favorites to win state but we really haven't spoken about them at all on this podcast just because they haven't been playing so they get back on track and and they'll hope to keep that going in spite of having a month between games they do have a very busy remaining schedule here in October playing five more games besides that game against Fenwick before the month's out and how about this other game on Sunday? Most would consider an upset. I would myself. Stevenson downing the Wolfpack, giving them their second regulation loss of the year. The Patriots win this one 3-1 to one over the Wolfpack. Brian Wojdelko, who was already a key piece of the Patriots last year, scoring two goals in this one, and Austin Morris in that stopping 25 out of 26. Yeah, that's a, that's a good performance by Austin Morris, uh, especially against that St. Ignatius team. It's one thing to have a lot of shots in a game, but one thing I think St. Ignatius does very well is find the best opportunities to score on those shots. So they record 26 in the game. Uh, Great performance by him. It was 0-0 after one, and Stevenson comes in there, and you know they had just lost three in a row, as I mentioned before. They get back on track with a win. So at this point in their schedule, it's bookended with wins. And... uh, They've got a a pretty busy schedule against some tough opponents coming up, so I'm interested to see how Stevenson builds on this win and keeps it going. And, you know, especially after last season, you looked at their record. uh, I think it ended up being, what, four four wins, three wins. They were just right above Fenway. That's about right, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and they're already at two. So I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that, that this game in particular on the road, at fifth third arena tough place to play is going to be a big momentum builder for them moving forward and last but certainly not least we did get our first new trier loyola matchup of the season and to put into a minimalist amount of words it did not disappoint how about this one trev's win four to three over the ramblers in overtime connor hirschtritt a hat trick that includes the game winner in, on over t- in overtime that I'm sure all of you saw on social media. Great job by Dylan who runs it. I mean, Dylan, you were you were there. I mean, what what stuck out? It, it was a heck of a game, but seeing it in person was probably five times better. So tell us about it. 
Well, before we even talk about the game, I want to talk about the crowd and the atmosphere. Both student sections packed that thing to the brim. Uh, I had a hard time finding a parking spot at uh, American Heartland Ice Arena, and I got there right around uh, start of game time. So uh, they were early, and you know there were lots of chants, lots of uh, you know maybe swear words going back and forth here and there. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't just the students. I mean, you know maybe not the swear words, but the parents were very into the game too. It was great atmosphere all around, not just in the bleachers, but, you know, around the glass, around the boards, by the benches and all that. Some of the, you know, varsity two or JV teams who maybe had a game up next were watching the game and, and everyone was very into it, but the game itself, very back and forth. Uh, Connor Herschert with the hat trick, as you mentioned, uh, he also gets the game tying goal early in the third period to make it 3-3 and send it to overtime. And then just want to say a great play by New Trier in this overtime as Loyola entered the zone, lost the puck, and then the goaltender, uh, Wyatt Schmidt, sticks it over to Baker. And then Herstritt, in the meantime, is you know kind of lurking in, in the neutral zone. He's tapping his stick. Baker recognizes that. And you can't see it on the video on Instagram, but Herstritt was anticipating that pass way sooner than he got it. So he was already streaking. He steps over the blue line right when the puck is passed. He has great awareness to come back right at the line to grab that puck, but not lose any momentum on his breakaway. And then it was a great move, backhand, forehand, gets it by Charlie Trapp. And then a big time celebration with all the boys and the students as well. I like the celebration dropping the stick, just going hands into the crowd. And, you know, something about that. I you watching the video, you think for sure Trap has that save. I mean, it is he leaves the smallest increment open on that left post or on that right post, pardon me. And it's just somehow he slips it in and new Trier slips away from the Ramblers in this first game. What a game it was. Thank the Lord we still have two more of those regular season matchups because, boy, they are going to be entertaining. So that was our recap of the week. I was going to say it's funny that you said that at the end because when I was recording, my only indication it was a goal was the crowd because I thought the trap had it saved too. And, uh, yeah, I don't know how Connor Herstrip found that time and space, but he did. And also want to say one more thing. Both teams unveiling a brand new jersey. We've yes. seen the new Trier have a new jersey every season as kind of a specialty. They usually unveil it for the first time against Loyola Gold. But uh, I don't think we've seen a, a specialty or alternate jersey from Loyola. We usually just have the, the gold, the maroon, and the white that they've been using for several years. But uh, that Loyola jersey, it's a gold one. It kind of looks you know, the same, somewhat the same, but then they have this nice striping on the shoulders and the arms. So, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, the Jersey battle over winter break has inspired some of these teams to get some alternates in rotation. Absolutely. That'll be a lot of fun when we get there. So obviously the Trevians have been hot. Let's talk to the head coach of another team that has been real hot. The St. Ignatius Wolfpack head coach, Spencer Montgomery joins us on this podcast, not only as a hockey coach, but owner of the Barn Hockey Bar. We'll get to hear him from multiple avenues of his careers, and this will just be a heck of a conversation. So let's roll the clip. And here he is, head coach Spencer Montgomery, head coach of the St. Ignatius Wolfpack. Not only that, owner of the Barn Hockey Bar. How are you doing today, coach? I'm doing great, Luke. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Um, so just to start things off, I want to talk about the Barn Hockey Bar, and I want to know about how this came together, how it is what it is today, because it is just, I've been there. I was there last year after playing a game of my own. I'll be there this year for the kickoff show. How, how did you guys get it to become what it is today? Because it is incredible. Yeah, awesome. You know, I I, uh, I moved to Chicago from Portland, Maine. Um, I was 25 years old at the time. This this would have been 2000, uh, 2014. And I moved in and worked for the Blackhawks for uh, for, for the next uh, eight, nine years. 
um, had an incredible experience uh, kind of working in pro hockey and feeling the energy um, that the city of Chicago has uh, for the game of hockey. I mean, this is an era, you know, so I came in 2014. I actually started the day um, af- the day after the Hawks lost to the Kings in the Western Conference final. Um, so remember, it was a brutal uh, it was it was a brutal ending to that year for the team. Um, it was an overtime loss, I, th- I think, in that game. And I remember going into the office and and it was my first day. And of course, everyone else from the from the office had been uh, had been up all night and and kind of working. But um, it, it, it was a time where um, the Blackhawks had taken over the city of Chicago and. Um, and uh, every, you know, and I remember going out that night before I started my my first day and every bar had hockey on every screen and everyone's wearing Blackhawks jerseys and there's 88s as far as the eye can see. Um, and, and then was able to be a part of the cup around the next year in 2015. Um, and, you know, and I tell that story because it, it showed me what what uh, what kind of a fever um, this city can have for the sport. Um, you know, everybody, the casual fans were all in and and wearing and buying merch and 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 hit the numbers and youth hockey were booming. Um, and you know, that's what I did for the Blackhawks. It was a lot of fun to to help to grow the game. And um, and so when I took over as hockey director at Ignatius and and left the Blackhawks all those years later, you know, I, I always knew um, that this city steps up and the hockey community steps up. Um, and so, um, you know, a building became available. It was close to Fifth Third where, where Ignatius practices and the Blackhawks practice. And and obviously, you know, it's the closest bar proximity to the United Center. Um, and when my friend Paul Marabella called me and said, do you think, you know, we could do a hockey concept? And um and we decided to, to say yes and push forward. And, you know, we kind of lucked out with Connor Bedard and, and, and what that brought to the energy of the city. We were, we're better to be lucky than good sometimes. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's it's been nothing but exciting since. Um, and, you know, we're excited for the future. I think Kyle Kyle Davidson's doing a great job and um, and feel like we're, we're starting to see we're, we're, we're kind of at the beginning of the hill again, watching the momentum of hockey pick up in the city. Hey, you talk about that Western Conference final. Still have somewhat mixed feelings about Alec Martinez being on the team now, but I'm I'm sure I'll grow to love him. Uh, I just want to ask, you know, the kickoff show last year, the barn had just opened, or maybe it was, you know, opening in the next couple of days. But now that uh, you've been in business for a year now, uh, and we're doing this thing again, what are you looking forward to most in terms of the actual live production that Max and Jimmy are putting together? Yeah, I mean, I I think it, I think it's a great opportunity to show people um how how developed and nuanced our league is. Uh, you know, we we we're really creating something with the SHL here. Um, you know, in in the in Illinois, and um, you know, if you come to a game and, and experience the crowds, you know, I know there was a great uh, Nutria Loyola game um this weekend with a packed crowd. I mean, it, it's a special experience. And you're playing for your community. You're playing for your school. Um. You know, I just there's it's hard to describe, but um, it, it's it's a memory for a lifetime. You know, you're really building a family, a foundation, a legacy, um, and and that's what's so great about high school hockey. And and so at the barn, we're, we're there to honor that. And you know, being a year in, we we've got some of the kinks worked out. So you know, happy to kind of unveil you know just how far along we've come in a year. And not only is the barn a hot place to be at in Chicago, but how about those Wolf Pack that you're coaching? I mean, what an incredible start to the season. You guys are 5-2-2, two, two, four points out of first place where the Trevians stand. What is different from this season compared to last? Yeah, you know, last year was our first year in the SHL. And um, the truth, the reality of the situation is that you you can't take a night off. And uh, every team is competitive. And, you know, I think we, we put ourselves in position early on last year to, to, to only be able to climb so far. So when it got into that, those kind of meaningful months of uh, December, January, the, the, our ceiling, we were limited. We were limited to where we could be. And so we, we were intentional this year uh, about being focused and, and dialed in early. Um, you know, I um, but but again, you know, we had a great we had a kind of uplifting win against GBS in overtime on Saturday night. And then we lost at home on Sunday um, to Stevenson. And and um, every night you got to be ready to go in this league. And and so we're still working on how do we prepare? You know, what does the 24 hours look like, you know, from one game to the next? You know, we, we play as much hockey as anybody or more in in in, in the state. Um and so we, we have to make sure that that we know what we're doing uh, every single night. 
Yeah, you talk about how pretty much every team in the SHL is competitive. You can't take a night off. Uh, you know, one thing I think is overlooked in pretty much every level of hockey is the overtime loss points. And, you know, you got two of them from, you know, New Trier and Loyola Gold. Obviously, you know, you prefer to come away with the win, but, you know, two of those is equal to a win in terms of the number of points. So, you know, how crucial is it to, you know, get those points, even if you don't come away with a win against the, you know, quote unquote favorites in the league. Yeah, we're always going to be, you know, we, we are going to be competitors night in, night out. So, you know, we're going to be in tight games. We we lost yesterday, but we had the goalie pole for that. That's that that caused the, the two goal differential. Um, but, you know, we we pride ourselves in being in the hunt and and, and maintaining, you know, that level of, of focus, I would say, throughout um what is it uh 49 minutes of a hockey game is that right no it's more than 51 51 um (laughs) so so, but we pride ourselves on on competing to the final whistle and and making sure that we're in these hockey games yet those points matter you know to be honest we had a three nothing lead against Loyola going into the third period so unacceptable to let that um to let that one slip away for as only one point um uh against new Trier, we got to get over the hump and simply we have not won a game um in two years against those guys and so we're we still looking to elevate and and solve that um i think it's no secret right now that the state championship goes through new Trier. um so um we're while i, I love the overtime point and love being competitive um we got to find a way last question on my part you worked eight years at the Blackhawks, like you mentioned. Do you have a favorite memory from working with them? Oh man, yeah. Um, listen, the night of the Stanley Cup. I mean, my uh, I had two amazing bosses. I, I had Annie Cammons um, and Pete Hassan. Uh, Pete Hassan, I just remember on the ice coming up to me and saying, "Hey, you're a Stanley Cup champion now." We had a huge hug, and um, just being able to experience that, I was able to get in the locker room um, after with, with the play. I mean, it was just such a special, cool night and moment, and to feel part of that um, was, was really amazing. You know, but through all the years, the friendships uh, in the front office, everyone was passionate about hockey. You know, I worked really closely with Laura Jordan and Sam Raddy as well. We're just like just wonderful people, and uh, and. and enjoyed my experience uh it honestly amazing amazing uh career to choose if you're um you know a young kid trying to figure out hey you know maybe i'm not going to get paid to play hockey how how else can i be a part of the game how else can i experience it and um you know i was afforded that opportunity with the blackhawks and uh it, it was really special i assume that would be the favorite memory just wanted to make sure though <laughs> <laughs> There are yeah. plenty. Of, there are plenty of good ones through the years, but that that that's hard to top. And I got one more for you. Um, you mentioned, you know, you're a busy team. You got a lot of games on your schedule playing in both the SHL and CCHL. Uh, do you think after last year, uh, you know, sort of being a quote unquote test run to, you know, see how you balance both of those leagues and the schedule? Uh, you know, what have you learned and and how do you kind of shift from the mindset of playing in the SHL to the CCHL? Because it is two different records, two different standings. And, you know, it's, it's just a lot of games and you kind of have to switch back and forth between your mind. Yeah, you know, I, I think part of it is, is you know, how do we manage every week? How, how, you know, how are you getting enough sleep? How do we make sure our practices are nurturing, um, you know, the, the the demanding schedule? You know, I can't, you, you, over over the course of, we played 70 games last year, over the course of 70 games, it's not going to be all sunshine and roses. So you, you have to manage the dips. Uh, and really, you know, I think one of the keys to this is ascending at the right time. I mean, you, if you look at the SHL, I truly believe this. And any team can can win on any night. How do you ascend? How do you make sure that you win in Bensonville? I, I think we're moving it this year. So, but 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 that's that's kind of the old. How, how do you ascend at the right time and get it done in the key moments? Um, and, and your first indicators coming up in this Thanksgiving tournament, which um, you know we were fortunate to to take down last year. But we know that that that's your first opportunity to have most, if not all, the of the big boys, so to speak, in in, in state and um, and kind of get a watermark. Um, you know, and I also think there there are some games, you know, between the two leagues that give you an opportunity to get other guys in. You might have a guy that that's gripping his stick a little bit and not finding the back of the net that this is an opportunity to, to 
get a more regular cadence on the shift and, and to get a little bit more opportunity. So um, definitely love that. And then we also, you know, we've got two varsity teams. So I, I call up guys um, in certain spots and give guys opportunities to, to kind of see our environment and culture and, and get a taste of that. Um, and uh, I, I think that's a positive thing for our organization. Coach, thank you so much for your time. Good luck with the rest of the season. Hope the Wolfpack do well, and we will see you next week for the kickoff show. Looking forward to it. Thank you, guys. All right. See you then. Have a good one. Cheers. Wonderful talk with Coach Montgomery. Big thanks to him hopping on. I mean, we've now gotten guests from numerous teams. We have him from the Wolfpack. We had Adam Cheris from the Trebs. We had Giovanni Senna from Fenwick, and it's just going to keep piling on. So we'll eventually get to every single team possible. We're already past a quarter of the way there. So, you know, we and go. now we're going to look to outside the SHL, which is ironic enough because St. Ignatius actually plays in the CCHL, one of the leagues that we're going to be covering. But for now, we're going to start with the IHSHL North Central. A very interesting league. Still not a lot of action. You know, it's still mid-October, so some teams are still feeling it out. I would say the only league that truly has a ton of action, like full swing right now, would probably be the IHSHL West. Which, by the way, Glenbard and Nequa Valley are tied for the top with a 5-2 and two record. And then it's an incredibly tight race. You know, the top 10 teams within the league and... Must I'd say that a lot of these teams have played seven or five to seven games, but the top 10 teams are all within seven points. I mean, you look at Lions, who's three and one, only played four games, shockingly. They're at nine points and they're in like 10th place. Everybody above has pretty square records. I think it's going to be a heck of a fight for the West this year. And then looking at the North Central, the other side of the IHSHL, still five undefeated teams. That includes Prep, BGHW, Evanston, Chicago North, and New Trier Blue. Shockingly, they have really just right. been able to keep a 3-0 record up to this point. Impressive stuff by them. And look into the CCHL, where Fenwick and St. Ignatius play. Bennett's at the top. They are the only 3-0 team. Fenwick's 2-0. St. Ignatius is 1-0. Still one team that has not played yet, and that's Brother Rice. So we'll keep you posted at... This week and the next week is when everything's really going to start being a consistent flow, and we will have endless hockey to talk about. But for now, that is our outside the SHL segment. So now we will look to the future. Our next week of SHL hockey, we have 10 games. We're going to dive into everyone right now. That was our outside the SHL segment, getting to talk about three other leagues within the state. Now we focus our attention back onto a packed week of SHL hockey, double-digit games. We're talking 10, and let's start things off with Wednesday, where we have two games, starting things off 7, 10 p.m. at the Glenview Ice Center, Stevenson on the road at the Glenbrook South Titans. Stevenson seeking a winning record. They're currently 2-2-1, two, two, and, two, two, and, and Glenbrook South looking for their first win at home. Yeah, uh, GBS is coming off that tough loss in overtime to St. Ignatius. Uh, of course, we touched on that earlier, but Stevenson is also coming in there with a win. And, and you know, Stevenson and Glenbrook South is a pretty good rivalry in the SHL. I think it's a better rivalry when Stevenson is a little bit more competitive like they are this season early on. I remember last year GBS uh, won a game five to four against Stevenson in overtime, and it was absolutely electric on the last day of the regular season for not just those two teams, but the entire league. And that secured the three seed for GBS. But, uh, you know, Glenbrook South, uh, you know, you know, the, they're undefeated in regulation so far. Again, a short schedule so far for them, just the 1-0-1, oh, but they're going to definitely look to get back on track at home ahead of a big weekend. And then Loyola, the only other team that has not lost in regulation. Of course, they are 4-0-1. Oh, Glenbrook South is 1-0-1. Oh, then we look 50 minutes later, 8 p.m. at the Alumni Memorial Fieldhouse. Lake Forest hosts St. Ignatius where they've already met once as the Wolfpack won four to three. 
Yeah, and uh, before we preview that game, just want to touch on your point that Loyola and GBS, the only two undefeated in regulation. How about this? We're not even halfway through October, and there are no undefeated teams still standing in the SHL. And, like, you know, there are a couple of those that haven't lost in regulation, but no teams have gone a perfect two points in every single game. So that just goes to show the parity of the league. That's something we talked about a lot in episode number one. But uh, that game, the St. Ignatius against Lake Forest, you heard Spencer Montgomery say it earlier, a busy week ahead for the wolf pack and uh you know we'll, we'll see how they respond to that that three to one loss to stevenson on home ice they'll be going on the road and lake forest is not an easy drive um for the teams you know not in that north shore kind of central area uh lake forest is about 30 minutes north of glenview which i know that and so i can only imagine how long of a drive it is for saint ignatius so they're gonna have to be ready and and Lake Forest has proven that they can be a gritty team. So I'm interested to see how that one goes. Then only one game on Thursday. It's the Patriots again playing on a back-to-back at Carmel, who's only played one game up to this point. Got it handed to them by Nutrier 9-2, but now a chance to turn turn things around at home, 8-30 Glacier Ice Arena. Yeah, and I think Carmel's going to go into that game with a lot of confidence. I mean, uh You know, it's hard to say that when you just lose nine to two, but you got to remember, just like Spence said earlier in this podcast, uh, it's no secret that the state championship runs through Nutria Green at this moment. So, you know, maybe they kind of needed that wake up call to show, you know, where they are in in terms of the rest of the league. And when you play Nutria Green, your next game is just going to be that much better because maybe you're playing a team uh, that has a little bit less skill, not to say that any team in the SHL is not skilled, but just new Trier green is seems to be on another level at this point. Um, you know, I'm, I'm interested. I'm, I'm looking for a fast start from Carmel in this one, if they want to come away with the victory and that should be a pretty good game. And then Friday, we actually only have one game. It's classic Friday night in Addison as Mm -hmm. Carmel who played Stevenson on a back-to-back come Thursday, will have their own back-to-back on the road at York, who's currently one, four, and two. What do you see about this matchup? Well, I think this is a good opportunity for York to get back on track. They got the win over Neutral Green, but besides that, it's been nothing but uh, losses in the books. And we talked about the value of overtime losses, and they do have two of those. So they are sitting at uh, four points in the SHL. And you know, Carmel coming off a of back-to-back York. This is their first game of the week. And uh, I don't think they didn't play much last weekend. So this is probably going to be their first game in a while. They're going to have some fresh legs. And uh, back at home ice, Addison is always a tough uh, arena to play in. Um, and yeah, I, I, I really can't say who's going to win that one. But Carmel seems to have uh, played pretty well over York uh, in the head-to-head over the last few years, just based on my memory alone. But uh, we'll see what happens. York could really use another win here, and and I think that they're going to look at that game as a good opportunity to get one. Then after that, we hop into three Saturday games, three Sunday games, six games through two days, and it starts off with two games starting at once, 6.30 at Twin Rinks, Glenbrook North takes on Stevenson, and then um, 6.30 at the Glenview Ice Center, York takes on GBS. Yeah, GBN, we talked about how they've kind of had a light schedule so far, just about a month separating uh, official games that have gone in the score sheet. But GBN's going to look to keep building on that win they had over Fenwick uh, on the road again against Stevenson. This will also be their third straight road match to begin the SHL season. I know they've had a couple preseasons or non-conference games, whatever you want to call them over there at Northbrook sports center. But uh, GBN is a a good team. I don't think it really matters where they play, uh, you know, besides the last change, I guess, but uh, Stevenson, uh, you know, we'll see what happens because they, they beat St. Ignatius and St. Ignatius beat GBN. So you can kind of go through that whole circle and, 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 you know, it's not going to give you much information on who's going to win the game, but that should be a good one. I think that uh, they'll play a pretty close game, and uh, we'll see who wins. 
Then at 650, Mount Prospect, Loyola Gold is at St. Vitor. So we have a 630, 630, 650. So we'll have three games in the ISHL going on at once. And this one should be entertaining. St. Vitor has been pretty red hot, but Loyola just such a well-rounded team. This this will be very exciting. Yeah, and uh, you know this is a this is a pretty decent rivalry in the SHL that goes back plenty of years before the league's existence. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Saint Viator, they they have a great atmosphere at home. I, I I really enjoy broadcasting or just going to games at Mount Prospect Ice Arena. Uh, they've got you know a good DJ system and and really gets the crowd into the game and it's always a tough place to play as a road team. So I'm interested to see how Loyola comes in there and counters that uh, on that Saturday night matchup. And then I did skip over the, the York GBS matchup as well. Uh, it'll be their second meeting of the season after GBS won three to one on their opening night over at Addison. And uh, these two teams have a lot of history. They've played each other a lot over the years including in tournaments and what have you. They met in the preseason tournament as well. So those two teams definitely getting to know each other here early in the season. And uh, GBS, it'll be their second home game of the week. We'll see what happens. And for Glenbrook South and York, GBS, 19 penalty minutes a game, which is first. And then York, 14.7 penalty minutes a game, which is second. So expect a lot of power play opportunities from each side. Could be a high-scoring battle for all we know. It's just if York can get out of that power play slump. I believe they're currently 4.3 within the 4-point-something range percent on the power play. That'll be a huge chance for them to get back into the power play-wise score sheet. And then for Loyola, Golden St. Fighter, both teams only allowing two goals a game. Should be a pretty good battle between expected goaltenders Brock Hare and Charlie Trapp. So then headed to Sunday... We start off 4-10 American Heartland, just like the same time last weekend when Loyola hosted New Trier, except this time Loyola is hosting the Fenwick Friars, who are looking to get a spark going in their offense, only averaging 1.9 goals per game. Yeah, and and you know Loyola will be back at home after a couple on the road. Their first home game since that game against New Trier, that same ice slot, 4-10 p.m. on Sunday. Uh Again, that, that that's probably going to be a good game as well. We've seen Fenwick, you know, kind of show some life against some of the the bigger teams in the SHL. They have those two wins as well, or actually three wins, excuse me, um, as their record is three and five. So they'll they'll look to maybe catch Loyola in a trap game and and take away two points at American Heartland. We'll see what happens there. And it's it, you also you know you look at this back to back situation. You, you, we expect Charlie Trap to start. Uh, against St. Viator, as we said. So we will probably see the backup goaltender for Loyola in net for this one. So an opportunity to, uh, you know, get some shots on net for Fenwick and and maybe a couple trickle in. For sure. Then 545 at Alumni Memorial Fieldhouse. Actually, shockingly, a pretty early game considering most game times at Alumni. Lake Forest hosting York. Huge game for two teams currently in the losing side of the standings to get two points. And Lake Forest, though, two and one at home, so they do have the advantage. Yeah, and and, and you said it. Um, you know, we'll see if either of these teams really catch fire down the stretch here, but I think this game will probably set the tone for that. Um, you know, you look at the SHL, there's 11 teams, eight make the playoffs. And, you know, a lot of teams will look at that and say, all right, well, you know, it'll be a gimme. We'll make it. But at the end of the day, there are three teams that miss the playoffs. And, and you know, if you kind of take that a little bit too lightly, you might end up being one of them. And, you know, we've seen teams with pretty decent records end up not making the playoffs just because there's so much parity in the league. So, you know, this is going to be a huge two points for whoever gets it. And it could really make a difference down the stretch. And then lastly, Sunday, 7 p.m., Mount Prospect Ice Arena. So it'll be back-to-back -back home games on Saturday and Sunday. For the Lions, this time they host Glenbrook South. So it'll be a tough weekend for them, hosting Loyola on Saturday and then hosting the Titans on Sunday. GBS and St. Viator, both on a back-to-back -back Sunday game. They're just going to be emptying the tanks in this one, Dylan. 
Yeah, and uh, over the years, Columbrook South has not had the prettiest record on the road in Mount Prospect. I mentioned it, it's a tough place to play with a great atmosphere, great crowd, great music, great you know DJ and, and game production over there at St. Vider. They do a great job. And, uh, you know, we, we will see what happens. GBS was one and two over the St. Vider Lions last season with the lone win coming on home ice at Glenview Ice Center. So, you know, St. Vider is probably going to look at that as an opportunity to, you know, continue that streak and and get a, a couple of wins here if they can beat Loyola and GBS on back to back nights at home. So now let's talk question of the week, and this will eventually collide with the Chicago Blackhawks high school rivalry series where games will be coming out eventually. Of course, we don't have anything official yet, but for now, we get to call the shots hypothetically. You guys get to call the shots hypothetically. Let's say you guys can pick one rivalry from the SHL that did not appear last year and one non-SHL rivalry that did not appear from last year. What two rivalries are you choosing, Dylan? Well, before I give my answer, please, to those watching at home, give your answers in the comments. We we want we want to give you a shout out. And I've got news for you. We picked the best answer. So far, we've had zero answers. So if you just comment anything, it will probably be the best <laughs> answer because it'll be the only answer. But my answer, first, I'll start inside the shl i'm gonna say saint ignatius and fenwick and these are the two newest teams in the shl both in their second season of participation and this rivalry is deep and it, it you know it doesn't just stay in the shl we talk about how those games between those two teams are you know double jeopardy games so to speak as they count for shl standings and cchl standings so the stakes are that much higher and i think you know, St. Ignatius never disappoints in terms of their crowd. And I think that that would be a great atmosphere between those two teams who also we saw meet in the Kennedy Cup final last year, which what a series that was. We had a pair of double overtime games in game one and game two. And, uh, you know, I think that this is a it could be a huge opportunity to to see a, a pretty good rivalry over there. And going to my non SHL rivalry, I'm going to shift over to the Chicago Catholic Hockey League and say that it should be Bennett versus Providence Catholic. And I have a great memory of doing color on the broadcast. I think it was three years ago now. It was the very first ever edition of the Chicago Blackhawks high school rivalry series. Uh, I was alongside Max Anderson for that one. And it was a great game, great crowd. And you know, both those student sections, fans, parents, what have you, they'll pack that place when those two teams are playing each other. That's a rivalry that dates back several decades uh, in the CCHL and, and uh, you know, elsewhere. I think that it would be really cool to see that one brought back. For me, SHL-wise, I love that pick. That would have been my second pick. But I'm going to go with something that not a lot of people – would expect maybe some of you don't remember, but also in the rivalry series archives, Stevenson and St. Vider played a game one time at Twin Rinks. I mean, not only is that a rivalry in itself, but that game, my goodness, Dylan, you were on the mic for that game. It was eight to seven, and it was just probably one of the more chaotic SHL games in memory. I don't see why we don't revive that for this year. Yeah, eight to seven in overtime as well. And I remember Max Anderson was meant to get the call on that one. And uh, Jimmy the Wiz Olsen unfortunately came down with an illness the night before. And Max gave me a call and said, hey, if, if you want to do play by play for this one, you're in. And I ended up staying all night uh, doing my preparation as I was so excited. And the game did not disappoint at all. I remember uh, St. Vider tied the game uh, with under a minute to go and since Max was taking over his job as the technical engineer, I remember, you know, the goal was here to my right, and so was Max. And in my peripheral vision, I just saw Max immediately lock in, trying to get that replay from all different kinds of angles. And it was just such a great experience, good fan atmosphere, and it always is for the Black Hawkery series. I'd love to see that one brought back. Non SHL wise, not one that has been selected for the rivalry series yet. I think that'll change this year. Not only do I want this, I think it'll change in general. These are two teams that have just constantly been on the rise. 
Deerfield and Highland Park, a North Shore battle. These two teams have been duking it out in the North Central. As somebody who played for the Chiefs last year in the North Central, I could tell you by talking to both teams, they just, let's just say, strongly dislike each other. And just working at Deerfield for football game, I was able to talk to Sam Schwartz. I was like, so do you guys like not like Highland Park in just hockey or is it everything? Everybody inside the booth goes, everything. Like they are programmed to hate Highland Park. I'm sure it's the other way around. I mean, you talk about the definition of rivalry. I think that is a rivalry that we are yet to see in the Chicago Blackhawks high school rivalry series. But I think we should get it this year because not only do they not like each other, but they play each other well. They are typically at the top of the IHSHL North Central standings, and that is just another one of the reasons why I think it should happen this year, and hopefully it does. But either way, we know the Blackhawks are going to do a great job with picking six good games, and hopefully we get that once again this year. Yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Of course, JNM Media, SHL Network will be broadcasting all of those Blackhawks rivalry series games as well, so it should be a great time. So, last segment, let's talk trivia. Dylan, would you repeat repeat the question from last week? Yes, the question last week was, who scored the game-winning goal in the 2022 state championship game? And we did not um, we did not say anything about the game or which teams were playing or even where it was. You had to figure that one out on your own. And that was the first canon state championship since uh the pandemic and it was held at the edge ice arena i know that part of the reason for that was the united center needed dates available in case blackhawks or bulls games had to be made up due to uh covid cancellations which was unfortunate that we couldn't have that state championship at the united center that year but it was the stevenson patriots winning five to nothing over the saint vider lions with the game winning goal scored by Dylan Jate. by the way, great first name on that kid in the first period. And uh, we have a winner. It was set tone dash H one W. So set tone. Congratulations. You have officially de- dethroned Dana uh, as the, you know, question answer. And uh, you were the first one who got it right, but we did have Dana Loken add that Jacob McDermott for GBN scored the game winner in the JV state championship. So Dana wasn't the first of the punch this time, but definitely made sure his voice was heard. Talk about a rivalry series. Let's have, I mean, we're having, we're starting to have a trivia rivalry. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) These two always get engaged. We really appreciate you guys interacting. And now this one, it's a pretty clear cut question. I want you guys to just simply guess. We would rather you almost be wrong than right. Just, I want to see if you guys can nail this off the top of your head. 2003, I'll give you guys a hint. 2003, Red Varsity State Champion. Who was that? It was not a powerhouse back in that era. It was not a team that won again and again and again and again. I'm not going to say who. Or the team in the 90s that won again and again and again and again. It's not those two, all right? So think outside the box a little bit. Let us know if you have it. And don't cheat, okay? Because this one's this one's a little bit easier to find online, but yeah. I just kind of want to look back in the archives just... and be like, let's find a state champion that won in an era where it was primarily dominated by two teams. So if you guys was, can uh, know, is the question what team won or, or what who team is won? What matchup? team won in the okay. Red Bar season? Team won, okay. Bonus so, points if you tell us who they beat. Yeah. So um that will do it. For this episode, episode five, another great one. Got to talk to Coach Montgomery. A lot of fun learning about not only his hockey knowledge with how he worked with the Blackhawks and now how he's the hockey director of St. Ignatius, but his you know experience with the Barn Hockey Barn. We hope to see you guys on the live or there for the Barn High School hockey kickoff coming on Monday. Dylan and I will both be there, so... If you see us, make sure to say hi. We would love to have conversations with you guys in person instead of just talking to you through a screen where we can't even hear your guys' responses. So, you know, just feel free to approach us when we're there, and uh, we'd love to talk to you guys. And thank you so much for your support on these episodes. It has been constant. And, Dylan, you said you had something to say. Yeah, and and speaking of that, just a a quick PSA to all of uh, our 
regular listeners, we will not have an episode for you uh, next Tuesday because your podcast episode will be the live show at the barn. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So uh, if you're looking for our episode on Tuesday of next week, uh, just go watch the the uh, kickoff show, whether you watch it live on Monday night or you watch it on replay. It'll always be there on the YouTube. All right. Big thanks, Dylan, for clarifying that because I forgot. So good catch. And we will see you guys for episode six in two weeks.